Let me welcome everybody to Tuesday night Big Book Study Workshop of the Program of Recovery. How we open this meeting is with the third step prayer. What's the first requirement making this thing work? God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take, Take away, away my difficulties, difficulties that victory over them, may I bear witness to those that will help thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do that will always. Okay, we're going to have a fun, intimate night tonight. Just kind of take it easy. We're going to cover some ideas that you hear a lot in the fellowship. That uh, kind of, And we're going to challenge the way a lot of people look at things. Anybody ever hear the expression, daily reprieve? It gets thrown around a lot in the fellowship. Anybody hear that a lot? Daily reprieve? I have a daily, we have a daily reprieve? Yes. Does everybody have a daily reprieve? No. <laughs> We're starting off good already. You didn't warn her, did you, Kenny? No. <laughs> Where's the first time they mentioned this daily reprieve? You hear it in meetings. Obviously, they make reference to it somewhere, and it has to come about somewhere. So page 85, we kind of look at what they're talking about, and then we're going to move backwards through this thing, right? So if they're talking about page 85 here, they talk about on 84 about this, this, this change coming about us. And where did this change Where did they first make reference to this change of the possibility of it being possible? Step two, right? Came to believe that a power grant of us could restore us to sanity. Why would we need this type of change? Well, because they outlined the problem in step one, right? So if if when drinking you have this thing called uh, allergy or phenomenon of craving, anybody get thirstier here when they drink? Anybody end up in all kinds of trouble when they drink? Anybody thought it was the trouble that was the problem and not the drinking? Anybody try to drink without consequence here? And then that's what gets our attention is the consequences, right? Then we come in here and hopefully you get hooked up with some people. Then you find out why I cannot drink without consequences because people who have this allergy can't control the amounts they drink. And if you can't control the amounts you drink, can you control the outcome? Anybody ever try to control the outcome? And that usually involves some type of a lawyer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you have the right to remain silent, not likely. <laughs> no. Anyhow, anybody make a firm resolution not to drink here again? Yep. Anybody tell the people around them that they're never going to drink again? Yep. Anybody pass a lie detector's test? How many people convinced themselves they were never going to do it again? Right? And anybody found they're unable not to not do it again? How many people has relapsed here? How about since coming to AA? See, a lot of people don't understand what relapse means. So you hear some people say, I've never relapsed. Well, then you wouldn't come to AA. If you're able to keep yourself, unless you're court appointed, then that's a different kind of whole set of regulations. But if you've tried to get sober and you're able to maintain that, idea and not drink again would you have come to AA how many people this was on their bucket list (laughs) hey hey, look accomplish this let's go to our first meeting yay a lot of us come here like neutered dogs right being dragged to get neutered or something like that we think it's the worst thing that ever happened to us how many people thought AA was the worst thing that ever happened to you how many people thought drinking was the best thing that ever happened yeah. to you? <laughs> See, now you know why you can't trust you, right? <laughs> ever come here and wonder why all, why all these people are so happy? What the hell? You, it's almost like you think your, your life sentence has started. I'm in AA. My life sentence has started. <laughs> right? Like, oh, my God. If AA was a, a life sentence, how long are you staying for? 
No, I think, but it's it's pretty remarkable when you look at some people who've been around here. Well, they have something pretty remarkable happening in their life compared to the life they talked about before, right? So the second symptom they talk about is the malady that centers in the mind. And they make description of that in a doctor's opinion. And page twenty three, they call it this thing that centers in our mind, the inability to see the truth at certain times. And you can't. And you hear people say, "Oh." Well, we don't know we're lying to ourselves because there's not that big of a conversation around it, right? We're just taking a drink. Anybody ever take a drink here and say, oh, what the hell am I doing? I'm not supposed to be drinking. How many people said that after they're drinking? I'm not supposed to be drinking. If you've got that kind of thinking, you're in trouble, right? And the reason you cannot, why can't you control and enjoy your drinking? Anybody ever try to control and enjoy their drinking here? If you're controlling it, are you enjoying it? And if you're enjoying it, are you controlling it? No. So and how many people are able to drink without consequence most of the time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Per- <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I don't leave my room. I remember <laughs> telling guys that, say, hey, Tony, we got some micro now. We got a 40. So as long as we don't leave the apartment, we'll be okay. Promise we won't go nowhere, right? <laughs> because it's going to be jail or hospital. Anyways. So we go through this. So on page 80, 84, they talk about this change happening here, right? And they talk about by this time, sanity will have returned. And then they talk about here, and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone. By, the, for, by this time, sanity will have returned. We will be seldom interested in liquor. If tempted, we will recoil from it like a hot flame. So that means you're going to think about it again. People give you the impression you're never going to think about it again, Right? It's kind of, you're going to think about it again, but based on truth and your spiritual condition, you'll be able to recoil from it, right? So then they talk about react sanely and normally. We find this has happened, happened automatically. We will see our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any effort on our part. So you weren't really involved in the change of this thing happening. Something created the change in you, right? On our part, it um, it has been given with any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been, what's that big word? Removed. removed. If something's removed, where is it? It's no longer present. Removed. Right? How many symptoms are there in alcoholism? What can you do about the first symptom, the allergy? Just don't put alcohol in your system. What, what makes it impossible not to do that? Is the malady. Anybody ever suffer from that here? The subtle form of insanity that precedes relapse into drinking? So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. For obviously this is the crutch of the problem. It's something you can't see, feel, and touch as it's happening. How many people's relapsed here and look back? I can't believe I did that. Just totally baffled at the idea that you're drinking again. Right? Being AA, we'll stick with that, right? But, yeah, we'll just stick with that. Okay, so, placed in position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It doesn't exist for us. We are neither cocky nor, nor are we afraid. This is how, this is our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition, not aware. Is there a difference between become, being aware of my problem and keeping in fit spiritual condition? So am I still in charge of my alcoholism? Am I working on my alcoholism? Am I applying these principles to my alcoholism? <laughs> well, see, we hear that all the time. We hear people say, I'm working on my alcoholism. Well, then you haven't recovered yet, have you? Because there's only two symptoms in alcoholism, right? So if you're still afflicted with alcoholism, what are you going to do? You're going to drink. And what makes you beyond human aid? Melody. The inability to choose at certain times whether you're going to drink or not. So if you can't combat the illness on that side of it, can you combat it on this side of it? When are you equipped to deal with alcoholism? Never. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. You just are unmanned and un- outnumbered. It just there's nothing you can do about it. And is that including after recovery? So when are you equipped to be able to deal with alcoholism? 
So when you hear people say, I'm working on my alcoholism, then it's an incorrect statement. Because alcoholism is two symptoms. Right? As long as those two symptoms are present, how effective am I going to be in my life? How many people has rebuilt their lives here? How many people has done good for a period of time? And what's taking you out of the game? Right? Out of nowhere, this thing happens and takes us out of the game. So we've never experienced recovery. What we've experienced is abstinence. There's a big difference, right? So after step 10 here, it talks about, it is easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a is stubble, stubble full. We're not cured of alcohol. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So a lot of people argue, oh, we can't maintain. Well, it's got to stay at a certain <laughs> level in order to function. Once it hits an empty tank, we're in trouble. Anybody ever have a, a car here with a broken gas gauge? That's kind of like our recovery. We don't know where exactly it is, but so we need to keep it at a certain level or be above. Right? Anybody ever feel really low in sobriety? Really, like like you're like like I mean low, yeah. depression low. And did you drink? No. You're able to get through. Anybody feel some extraordinary highs and extreme gratitude and grateful in their life? And did you drink? Now, before recovery, anybody ever experience any lows? <laughs> did you drink? Yeah. Anybody experience any highs? Did you drink? Anybody not experience anything at all? And did you drink? So, so, <laughs> right? So you hear people say, I stay sober under any and all conditions. We get drunk under any and all conditions. We don't need a condition to drink, do we? Because our condition's a condition that we need a condition. Right? And so, right? We need something to bring about a sense of ease and comfort, to feel comfortable within our own skin. Anybody feel like their skin just don't fit? Anybody feel that before they got into this solution? So that's what they talk. Until I get here in 10 where the problem's removed, what is the likelihood of me drinking in between the start of this thing and getting there? It's pretty, pretty, why don't a lot of people drink in this process? It's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's called an act of providence. Something kind of governs us. I don't know what it is, but I've never met, it's, it's kind of really weird. In all my experience, any time I've shown a real willingness to do this thing, I've never really gone south. When I stopped doing this thing or stopped developing this thing, it wasn't long before I wasn't here anymore. Right? Anybody, like an act of providence. I don't know if anybody has ever experienced that. Is, is you get removed from the, the life you're living and you have a moment of clarity. And mine usually was either God is or isn't, like a moment of prayer, like, and I chose not to pray. And I was relapsing shortly afterwards because I was feeling good about me. Anybody feel good about their sobriety and feel great about what's going on and think it's you doing it? How many people have felt good about them and the great job they're doing keeping them sober and celebrate with a 24-hour chip? Well, come on, I can't be the only one here baffled at my inability to impress me on a continuous basis by keeping myself sober. I like to go to a meeting talk about how great I'm doing keeping me sober and look at everything I'm working on. I'm working on this, I'm working on that, I'm working on coming back, <laughs> I'm working on... Anybody, you hear a lot of people when they talk, the basis of their recovery is who? Themselves, Right? And if that's the basis of your recovery, have you been able to fix yourself before? That's part of the three pertinent ideas. What are the three pertinent ideas after how it works? A, that we're alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. A, that we're alcoholic and could not manage our own thinking. You know what the definition of unmanageability is in step one? Is the inability to get sober based on your own thinking. If you can't get sober, wouldn't you call that unmanageable? Why well, are you getting loaded all the time? I don't know, a little unmanageable. <laughs> right? And you can't recreate your life if you're re getting loaded all the time, can you? Can you? That would be a little unmanageable. Any, anybody here get a promotion at work? Life's going really good. And then get loaded again? 
What happened to the promotion? What happened to really good? Anybody baffled at the continuation of relapsing, regardless of everything you've tried on your own resources? And then you get introduced to this and the problem gets removed. So those who I find of the most contented sobriety are those, their lives are based on something other than themselves. You hear it when they talk. It's as the result of this course of art, they've come to know an inner resource of strength. They've, they've come to rely on this thing. And you hear people say, all our understanding of a higher power is the same. It's the same. It brings about peace, contentment, joy, hope, strength, direction. That's the basis of this whole thing. You may call it, whatever you call it, a secondary, but the basis of it is, is the same. Is the idea that if I get access to this thing, it could change my life su- sufficiently enough for me to enjoy where I'm at and to be comfortable in my own skin. Because if I'm not comfortable in my own skin, how long am I going to stay here for? So, say, so they say the problem's removed. How does the problem get removed? Through the course of action. Where do, and how am I to find this course of action? That's what this book is about. So when you go through right from the very beginning here, and it really it's really hard. I don't know why. It's kind of difficult because when you say, I'm no longer dealing with alcoholism, people kind of get, eh, anybody's brain go a little, eh. Because people give you the, the impression that you're dealing with alcoholism for the rest of your life. When have you ever been able to deal with alcoholism? That's one of the requirements. We have two alternatives. One is to keep on going the way we're going or to accept spiritual help. So when does the change come as the result of this thing? Does it come in step two, step three, step four? Yeah. So it comes in ten. We just read here as the result of this course of action. Because whether we agree to step one or not doesn't change step one. You ever notice that? Anybody ever deny being an alcoholic here? Did it change anything? Anybody accept that they were an alcoholic here? Did it change anything? But it's the solution that we get into. So when we go into this thing, they talk about here the development step. They talk about much on page 85. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed, what's that nasty word? Directions. We've begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we've become God conscious. Where's the first time they made reference to this thing is, is the basis of necessity in order to get this thing. Well, if you say kind of step two was an idea, but where did they give us this reference to begin? So a lot of us say, oh, I, I know where I want to end up. I want this change. I want this psychic change. I want this thing that I think is down the road. But where do I get access to this thing so I can start experiencing it now? And how it works, it says, may you find him later. Now. What's now mean? Now. Right? So how and where am I to find this thing now? Well, where did it make reference? So this is, is a conclusion to an idea they started way back there, isn't it? If we've careful, carefully followed direction. So we'll go through it again slowly. If... The biggest word in the book. If we've carefully followed directions, we've begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we've become God conscious. Where was the first time they made reference to this God consciousness, this thing deep within? In We Agnostics, page 55. Whose idea is this? Mine or yours or theirs? Theirs. How many people would have came up with that? Right? That's why they say, let us explain to you the solution first. Then you choose your own conception. But the basis, you have to understand what we're talking about. Because I would have never came up with this idea. Like my church teachings, the, 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 uh, the evangelical movement I come None of this was in here. Like in some of my, my preconceived ideas ran really deep against blocking me about the idea of God being personal to me. I guess it started way back, long before I could even put, a, put my finger on where the problem was, but there was a deep-seated problem. Even when today, 30 years later, when I read that we were reborn, it still gives me a little eh behind the... Eh. I agree with it, but it, it's, a, it's something that runs deep. Some of us have some deep stuff, which is around step six for me, right? So when they talk about that on page 55... 
they talk about this thing taking place deep down within. And they give us an exercise on how to get access to this thing. Anybody know what the exercise is? In a general way. They, get, they say if this thing is deep down within, and it's, it's in an, actually we're fooling ourselves. We're deep down in every man, woman, and child. Not in some people. In all of us. They're saying all of us have the same access code. All of us have the same thing. What, what You want to call it a secondary, but we all have the same thing. This is what makes us human. Unless you're a sociopath, you have this thing deep down within you. It's always been there. So how do they make reference to this thing that they're talking about? This God consciousness, this thing. What does it look like before we understand what it is? Anybody have that voice that asks you questions? What are you doing? And you answer it, I don't know. (laughs) What's the matter with you? Good question. I was hoping you'd be able to answer that. <laughs> Anybody ever look in the mirror and ask you what's the matter with you? And you realize it's not you asking the question? Come on, I can't be the only one. Maybe, maybe I have more problems than I suspect. Am I? <laughs> Don't answer that. Anybody have that whisper? Go, what are you doing? Come on. Every day. Every <laughs> day. That, that's not something that wants more for you than what you're experiencing. Anybody have that? Impitable, incomprehensible demoralization and something says there's a different life for you than what you're living anybody ever said there's got to be more than what I'm having here how many people has, has that wife experience there's got to be some it comes from in here it's something that, that's deep down and then when you look back over your life you realize this thing is, has been there all along you ever talk to kids you ever wonder who kids are talking to when they're alone they got their buddy no, you don't. Yes, I do. Then you get older. You're right. No, I don't. And they get older. You hear kids say, I can't hear. Hear what? I can't hear God anymore. You hear kids say shit like that. It's kind of like, whoa, freaky. But when you kind of go through this in step 11, how many people practice step 11? The, the disciplines. and It becomes a working part of the mind. It, the, the disciplines. It's not about the steps. People say, I'm working the steps. It's not about the steps. Once you have this connection, it's about the connection and maintaining that through these principles. It's, it's removing the, the, cate- like the, the classification of the stuff. In step 11, how many people realize that all 10 principles are in step 11? In order to work step 11, you need to do the 10 previous principles. People argue, oh, it's about step 10. If you're doing 11, you're doing 10. If you're doing 10, you're not doing 11. Oh, what? <laughs> Think about it. If you're always in trouble, who's, who's running the ship? If you're having to apologize all the time and then bring God into it, anything that's kind of ass backwards? Right? How many people want to apply the brakes after the accident? <laughs> so what this process is like is, Anybody ever driving one of those big old boat cars? Yeah. When I went through Detroit when I was a kid, 16, all the cars were all smacked up, eh? Big caddies, eh? Bumper a little this way, door kicked in this way. Remember the little car scratch here? That's how you used to park, eh? By sensor. The old cars, eh? And the poles and stuff. And that's how we go through life, by sensors. Bang, bang. <laughs> Smashing into everything. In collision course. Our cars, if you... if. If we looked like cars, it'd be a little banged up and look a little shitty, and the paint job would be scratched to hell. The interior would be like, <whistles> if we were a car, wouldn't be? The lights would be going, the sensors would be gone, the tires would be wobbly. That's how we come in there. Eh, we're going into the service depot. <laughs> how are you? Not bad. Can you check the oil and wash the window for me, please? And everybody's looking at the car going, holy shit. But you're used to driving it. You compensate for weight. Anybody ever drive a really shitty car here? You compensate for the car. Anybody? I used to have three uh, brake calipers that worked. One didn't because I had a nail in it. Like I cut the line, I put a nail in it. And so, and so my car would, when I hit the brakes, would go that way. So I'd steer the wheel going this way. Anybody have a wheel that goes that way? Your car's going that way and you're always compensating for it? 
That's how we go through life. I was in one guy's car. He picked me up on, in a snowstorm because he couldn't work the wipers, the strings. He had strings tied to his dots. <laughs> he, he was drinking. It was funny. On a 401, I pulled it. He says, he says, yeah, I'll give you right, but you got to pull the string back when I pull it this way. So we're working this way first with, with the heater going, drinking, mitts on, and like freezing to death in a snowstorm. Anyways, I didn't think there was a problem with it. It made perfectly good sense for him to pick me up in this snowstorm. Anyways, that's how we go through life. If you kind of look at it, how many, how many people compensate their life that way? Anybody observe your life and go, what the hell are you doing? We're sitting in the car. We're quite comfortable with what we're doing. It makes sense to us. Observers who watch us going, what are you doing? What's the matter with you? How long, well, like, try to get an explanation why you're living and doing the things you're doing. Anybody ever try to explain to somebody why you're doing what you're doing and living the way you are? And anybody get irritated with them? even asking me a stupid question like I know the answer <laughs> or why are you always going down that road anybody even ask that question you're implying that there's a different road like there is no different road when you're governed by alcoholism it's kind of like you're governed by something else so they talk about on page 55 this thing always being there so if you look back over your life how many times have you had this kind of unexplainable thing said don't go this way go that way don't do this, do that. And you listen to it and it kind of was saving grace. How many people found times they didn't listen to it? Then you spend the next two days going, I should have listened. Why wasn't I listening? Anybody ever walk into a room and there's a really good event happening? People are really have a kid's party, say a kid's party, everything's happening. You ever feel the energy as you walk in the room? You become a part of it. You ever walk into a meeting and it's solution oriented? You know, something happens, you just kind of get connected to it. If you're kind of in tune to what's going on, if you're not in tune, you kind of... Anybody ever walk into a room and people are silent, you know there's something going on? You don't know what it is, your spirit goes, uh-oh, uh-oh. And if you're like me, it's like, did I miss something? No, no. But if you're normal, you'd leave that something with, oh, like re recoil, retract, get away from this situation. And then pretty soon you get here and that voice is nil. Is voided. It's very numb. It's very, like, very distant, and it takes really extreme situations to hear it again. And they call most people call that a moment of clarity. <clears throat> Only people has moment of clarity. I mean, it's an interrupt interruption in the way you see see things, or an act of providence that steals time and kind of makes you totally aware of what's happening. And then you become like, oh my God, what's going on here? The day before is the exact same situation, exact same people, exact same elements, but just something created a shift where you seen life as it was. And, it, and then you either acted on it to work, to, work to, to get help or you ignored it long enough for it to go away. How many people have been in those both situations, right? So they're saying here, by the time you get to 11, this thing becomes a working part of you. So what are you depending on now? The steps or this relationship? Why do I need to be dependent on the relationship and not the steps? Hmm? I can't control Yeah, because it says here, if I don't get this relationship, what's the likelihood of me getting sober? Because what's still governing my life? Oh, well, and I can't see, feel, and touch it. Right? Because it's confusing. Because I felt really good and got loaded. Anybody? Yeah. And I felt really bad and got loaded. We went over this, and the book talks about this thing, right? But when I've connected to this source and I've experienced it, I've never gotten loaded. So it's pretty wild. I don't know how to explain it, but I know the difference between when I'm in source or in connection or in consciousness compared to when I'm not. Right? And we've kind of talked about that. But if you've never experienced it, you wouldn't have nothing to compare it to. All you have to, to compare it is those that went before you and said this is possible and this is what they experienced. And it sounds good. It sounds like the same idea as the first time you heard someone talking about smoking pot. Huh. Or the first time you heard someone talking about drinking. Yeah. Or you've seen people drinking. You knew there was something good there. Anybody? Until you had that drink, 
a lot needed to be explained to you. And then you had that drink. Did anything need to be explained to you after that? And that's kind of like spiritual matters. It's the same thing. Once you experience it, you know when you're not having it anymore. And that's what step 11 is all about. That's why they, it's a 24-hour clock to keep you in check. Why people realize is because they never get the clock happening or the development, which is step 11. And then what happens is you're slowly becoming counsel with self again, and you don't know it because it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. You don't know you're disconnected because you're getting back into the comfort zone of being discomforted. Because we get comfortable in, in situations normal people couldn't tolerate. Our threshold for pain is amazing. We're not wimps, are we? If anybody did to us half the stuff we did to ourselves, you'd be a little pissed off, eh? Now you know why you're angry. <laughs> Look what you've been doing to yourself. How many people have been really giving it to themselves? So we go back through here, and they talk about it's deep down within we're fooling ourselves. So when we go through this thing, why is it that I can't keep myself sober? Yeah, doesn't that the malady is, we see as a symptom? We understand that. So when we know that, a lot of us think knowledge is the answer. How many people have thought knowledge is the answer here? I'll just watch out for it. And this is what I'll do to fix it. I'll bring it to meetings. I'll get it a job. I'll get it a relationship. I'll get money, power, and prestige. And if I get feeling, if I get this list of things, then I'll have the solution for alcoholism. How many people did the list of things? And it makes you feel better, but there's a problem is the underlying problem has not yet to be removed. Then how many people relapse after that? Yep. And does it tell you how long it'll take you to relapse? Some people can stay sober years, miserable for years. I mean sober for years <laughs> before the insanity returns. Some people in the fellowship don't have the second symptom, the malady. They can go undetected in this field for years and you hear their share that's why it's so confusing for for people who are coming into this thing because they don't understand what the problem is and they hear all these other solutions just don't pick up anybody hear that will that work for the person of this type this book describes right how about ignoring it how about surrender how about letting it go how about turning it over how about reminding myself every day we have a big book page we got this guy says Every day I remind myself about step three. I ask for help and I don't pick up. And what I say is, can you show me where it says that in the book? And, and their answer usually is, well, this is the way I do it. It works for me. Are you sponsoring people? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> you're killing them, right? Anybody ever try to get sober on other things other than what's presented in here? Or you've been there. How many people trying to get sober and never really did this? And still getting loaded. So that, that's the outcome. So when they say rarely have we seen a person fail, what do they mean by rarely? Well, rarely have we seen a person fail means that if you're following this path, you know what they, what they used to talk about? Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed a path. You know where that kind of idea comes from? Anybody know where that idea comes from? Why they'd use that terminology? I don't know if it was the Second World War or the First World War. It was landmines. And they'd put all these landmines in the fields. And there would be somebody's job, probably an alcoholic, to go find out where the landmines were. And what they'd do is they, they would put little flags or little things or little markers where these landmines were. And they'd create a path through this, this field. And if you followed that path exactly and precisely as the person in front of you, what would be the likelihood that you'd get through it? Good. And that's what they're saying here. We've put a path together, and in how it works, they talk about, if you kind of look at this thing, it's really interesting in how it works. It's a summary of the course of action that they took, but they also talked about, here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. When they make that statement, they're saying they've already taken them. They already know how to get through the land, the landmine, the landfill. And where's the biggest obstacle that you're going to have to face? In the mirror. 
Yeah, yourself. How many people knew that when they started this thing, that you were your biggest obstacle? That there was only one person talking you out of this on a daily, pl- daily basis? How many people found that surprising? I found it very surprising that I was the cause of all my problems. It came to me as a big surprise. And when I started informing people around me, which took around a fifth step, to be honest, I kind of went, holy shit, I'm the cause of all my problems. They were going, make the way. <laughs> but trying to tell me that for years. I just didn't get it because, you know, self, right? So they talk about here this course of action. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. The reason they ask you to remember it is not to remember these things. A lot of people, oh, I've got to remember these things. If something's cunning, baffling, and powerful, how would you be able to outthink it? They're thinking, it says, oh, I've got to remember these things. And if I remember these things that is cunning, baffling, and powerful, then I'll have the edge on it. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, remember. Remember what? That you're dealing with an illness you can't remember. You're dealing with a phantom, a ghost, this thing that parallels what you're sound thinking. And when it makes the click, you don't hear the, the shift. And when it makes the shift, it's talking to you like it never changed conversations. That's pretty scary when not even you can see the shift in your own thinking that's now governing you. And then after you pick up, you go, oh my God, what am I doing? Can't believe I'm here again. Anybody have that kind of thinking? So remember, you deal with something you can't remember. Remember? Oh, good. So then what's, what's my alternative? If I'm dealing with something that I can't see, feel, and touch, and it centers in my mind, and they call it a phenomena, it's on page 37 if you want to look at it later, is that left to my own devices, I'm going to continue to relapse. That's the promise of step one. Now I'm in trouble. Right? Bill talked about that. He felt like the gates of hell, right? He, alcohol was his master. He realized his fate was... He was going to die. There was nothing he could do. All his best efforts kept on landing him where? Loaded in the hospital. No words can tell the loneliness and despair. It took Abby showing up in Bill's life to walk him through, which is an act of providence when you think about it. An act of, is, is it is an intervention or an interruption in your course of action that saves you from the fate that you're awaiting. Most of us get that here without realizing it. There's an intervention that stops. It's like a kid running for the staircase. He doesn't see the staircase. The adult goes, whoa, stops him. There's a moment of stopping. And then if you continue to run, then it's nothing we can do about it. Right? So the act of the moment, right? And most of us get here an act of providence when you kind of look at the way your life was. And then you're sitting in a meeting and you're talking to somebody who's trying to help you and you're refusing to help. (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of, you find that funny later <laughs> but I mean at the time like people are trying to actually take care try to help you and you're trying to use your own thinking to fix you anybody still have that problem because we don't fully understand so here they talk about here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery one we admitted we were powerless over alcohol are they talking present tense or past tense But you hear new people saying, oh, we admitted. So here it's a we program. So by you admitting, how many, who's new here? <coughs> Nobody new here. Okay, so, so being new, and you, if you were to admit you're powerless over alcohol, and me admitting I'm powerless over, are we coming from the same place? And that's the same. They found a solution to their problem where you've yet to find a solution to your problem. So I would be saying new is I am powerless over alcohol and I haven't found a solution to my problem yet. My illness is still killing me. I was powerless over alcohol. I'm no longer powerless over alcohol, but I don't keep me sober. It sounds kind of funny. My dependence is on my relationship with a power greater than myself. So alcoholism is removed. It is, if this was alcoholism in my life, it would govern my life, but now it's removed. It's not my concern. That's what step two says. As the result of this course of action enables me to find a power or grace or a connection with something greater than myself that what? Keeps the problem at bay or removes it? Removes it. So if I have a car with a gas tank gauge that doesn't work, what's my job? Is to top up every day. If I top up, I never have to worry about running empty because I don't know when I run empty. And when I run empty, what happens? 
I relapse. So my job is just to make sure the car is topped up. How do I make sure the car is topped up? It's like step 11. Right? If I start going, well, I, I put some gas in it yesterday. And I get into that discipline. Then I go two days. And then, then I'm in the three days. And then I'm, I'm counting how many kilometers I've gone. I'm starting to count how I'm keeping me sober now. Anybody ever broken gas gauge? I got that on my bike. I, I reset the kilometer clock all the time. Sometimes I forget to set it. One time I didn't realize I didn't set it at all. Nothing, or I reset it, something. And I thought, I got lots of gas. And then I realized I was reading it wrong. It was back on a different setting. I nearly ran out of gas coming off the highway one by depending on it. And that's kind of like sobriety. Anybody ever been in those new uh, electric cars? Those Teslas? You almost have to do nothing. You don't even know it's running. Like now you could actually drive from here to put it on autopilot and drive from here to Hope. And it has all the sensors you need to govern yourself correctly. You be aware, you keep watch, but it's, it, go, it lets you know the cars in front of you, everything around, all the sensors come on, these little lights come on, and, but you're relaxed in this vehicle going, it's no longer like the, the car you came in with, touch and feel and bump sobriety, and brakes and all, running the shit, all the lights going. It's kind of un- governed by a different thing. All you need to do with that car is make sure it's plugged in every night. You have everything you need to keep going, and that's like step 11. And then when these little sensors come on, you take corrective measures, or the car corrects itself. And that's like the spiritual path that we're offering here. It's no longer me doing it. Does that kind of make kind of sense? And that's what they're saying here. So, I said, here are the st- um, which we su- suge- are suggested as a program of recovery. So they talk about the process, and if you read it, it is, it is in past tense. We, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmet. Came to believe, made a decision, made a searching and fearless moral inventory, admitted to God, we were entirely ready, humble, came, continued to take personal inventory, sought through prayer and meditation. Then it says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result or a result. You ever hear people say as a result? How many people heard people say as a result? That's why we kind of stick to what, because if you hear somebody say something enough times, you start thinking it says that. And you're looking right at it, and it says the, but you trust in your brain, and you're saying a. Anybody ever read how it works and do most of it by memory? You're just going through it, kind of blah, blah, and then you get fouled up because you're thinking and your intellect's getting in the way of what you're actually reading. Anybody ever have those problems here? You're trying to think and read at the same time? And how well do you do when you do that? That's like going through life. You're trying to go through life and you're thinking? How well? No, sorry. Anyway, you find that funny later. Okay. So as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message or a message. So they're very specific. What's the purpose of the steps? Having a spiritual awakening is the result. There's no other purpose for it. Because if I don't have a spiritual awakening, what's my fate? Because what's still present? Alcoholism. Right? Am I equipped to deal with alcoholism? Do I apply these principles to alcoholism? How many people's brains just having a hard time with it? We think we apply these principles to alcoholism. How am I equipped to deal with alcoholism? I made that distinction in step one. So when do I get the power to deal with alcoholism? I never. It's either removed or I suffer from it. Right? And if we don't understand the basis of it, then we don't get to the real, real, enlight- or the real development step is my relationship with a power greater than myself is what the promises are built on will suddenly realize that I'm able to do for myself what I was never able to do for myself. <laughs> Does it say that? No. It says, as a result of me working on myself, I have a new freedom and new happiness. <laughs> you ever watch anybody work on themselves? They're not experiencing a new freedom and new happiness. More like a constipation. And a... <laughs> you ever see the look on people who are working on themselves? I'm working on myself. Oh, my God, stop. <laughs> stop working on you. Come on, how many people have worked on themselves here and find the problem increases? 
the more you concentrate on yourself, you ever notice the worse it gets? What's our first obsession? Us, what's our favorite topic? What's the problem? Mm. <laughs> I need to find somebody as, as thrilled with me as I am. <laughs> Another AA relationship. Yeah, I can fix you. Okay, so, sorry. So then they talk about the second phase of this. Many of us exclaimed, what in order? I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these. We're not saints. The point is that we're willing to work these steps in all our affairs and continue to work on ourselves, concentrate on ourselves, <laughs> talk about ourselves. And when I see a problem, work on it. Oh, that's not it. Work on my character defects. That's what I'm uh, charging. Oh, shit. Doesn't say. Let me reread that. That's where we hear it, don't we? We hear it. Where do we get that idea of working on ourselves and fixing ourselves and these character defects? I'm working on this. I'm working on that. Me, me, me. Treatment centers. What? Yeah. It's, isn't it? It's the manifestation of the obsession in the game. Yeah. How many people are obsessed with themselves here? We all are. That's our favorite topic. And there's no way of getting rid of this concentration without what? This relationship. The more spiritually based we become, the less we concentrate on ourselves. Anybody ever notice that? And the more spiritually based you are, do you ever notice the more happier and contented you are? Right? You become like waterproof. You ever see waterproofing? The, the water just runs off of you. Like, that's life. It's just kind of, you match calamity with serenity. You know, to, and, until we know how to handle situations that used to baffle you. I used to wonder, what are you still doing in those situations? <laughs> right? You intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle you. What are you doing in those situations? My sponsor said, setting the alarm clock for work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> used to baffle you. Showing up and doing eight hours of work. <laughs> Paying people their money back. Okay. Taking care of your past. How many people are working on their step nines? How many people did their step nines? How many people are hoping they never get there? <laughs> it's the inability to face life on life's terms. Anybody strong suit is that? So you hear people have been sober a while in this way. They, they, they seem to be juggling a lot of different things in their life. And they're able to stay concentrated on what's going on. Like if I told you what was happening around my circle with people, places, they, my life and all. You know, any one of those problems used to cripple me emotionally. Any one of those things. Now I'm able to keep them all in their compartment, still be here, being able to be of service as best I can and get through this process and enjoy life. Effort, yeah, and all that's required is, is the ability to continually to shift my thinking to what? Practice these principles. What are the principles? The ideas that keep me connected to what? Power, right? Because how many times in step 11 does it say stop and do step two? Stop, do step one. Stop, do step three. Stop, do step four. Stop, do step nine. Stop, do step 11. Stop, do step 12. It doesn't. It says if I'm, if I'm building this relationship, it becomes like a relationship. Like, my wife and I, we're in sync. We're like 90% of that. We laugh, we're hitting the same jokes, the same thinking, and everything. It's really uncanny how, how much we're alike. Like, when we laugh our ass off, right? And I know what gets her going. She knows what gets me going. Some days we have fun with that and push some buttons. But other days when we're spiritually fit, you know, we don't do that. <laughs> but it's real. And that's kind of like a working part of the mind. So when they say that in step 11, what are they talking about? It becomes a, work, it becomes a part of you. It's not an exercise. It becomes like my relationship with my partner, my wife, my best friend, my soulmate. Is not, it's not work. But when we get off track, it takes some concentration to get back on track. Right? It takes some effort, some, oh, what got us here? We, we review it and we avoid those pitfalls in the future. That's what step 11 is about. So when you become enriched with this relation, you ever watch some people that have this thing? They just seem to have a glow and a, a something about them. There's just something about them that's hard to explain, but there's something different about them. What was the first thing Bill noticed about Abby? 
something about his eyes. And maybe it was a great example of, of this thing, but he didn't maintain it or have, uh, have the whereabouts to develop this thing because there was no book. It wasn't in print back then. There were certain ideas and principles to put him up. He was able to enlarge or, or maybe he didn't have the benefit of contact that we have today or the book, and he ended up relapsing. Alcoholism returned. Then he got back on track. He ended up dying sober, but he really struggled with this thing, right? Bill struggled with this thing, but he didn't struggle with alcoholism. When the thought came back, when he was plagued with depression, is depression alcoholism? It's the human condition. Where do they talk about this human condition that we all have? Well, the, the, the bedevilments, but they start here on page 60. And they start going through this, and they talk about the human condition. And on page 62, they talk about it, right? They talk about here, So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run right. But the, so if we're an extreme example, who else has these characteristics? Everybody who's a human being that doesn't have a, a psychological problem that puts them out of the game. Social power, whatever. Anybody who's able, instinct-based, means everybody has this. Everybody, anybody know people around who have anxiety, depression, resentment, who are not alcoholic? So you hear people say, oh, I'm this way because I'm alcoholic. No, you're only one way because you're alcoholic. You may have caused more damage than other people, but as long as you're suffering from alcoholism, then you'll never be able to get to the real problem, the underlying problems. Because until the alcohol problem is solved, will you be able to get to the other problems? So the first point of the exercise is to create a shift where I'm no longer dealing with alcoholism. Now we get down to the root and cause, which is my human condition. And that's what they talk about. And God makes this shift possible. So like in step six, people think it's about your character defects because we get obsessed with these ideas of fixing ourselves. If step six was about your character defects, then you wouldn't need to work on your spiritual condition. All you need to work on your behaviors. So we see that our problems become is because we're disconnected from source. And where did we discover this? That where our problems come from? is in the fourth step, right? We see because we're instinct-based. Anybody see that in your fourth step? And why did we involve other people? Because selfish and considered to get what I get or to keep what I get or to rob you from what you have. Whoa. So we see it's not the selfish and inconsideration that's my problem. It's my instincts are out of whack and I'm trying to secure something or get rid of something. Anybody realize that? And then they say, well, now you see why you're like this because you're animal-based or instinct-based. If you're instinct-based, you have no concern for nothing and nobody but you. But when we become spiritually based, our whole shift starts being governed by something different. So when I become instinct-based, is my problem. So I discover that in my four. When I become more spiritually based, there's more thought and concern for other people. You ever notice that? You're more in tune with life and the world around you. It's just things are a little brighter. Things are a little more harmony. You ever wake up one day and just everything's gone to shit? Everybody you run into is an asshole. Nobody's ever woken up that way? And then one day you wake up and, boy, what a beautiful world we live in. Isn't everything wonderful? What's the difference in those two realities? The world's the same. Any, I don't know if FYI. The world's the exact same place it was 30 years ago when I sobered up. Whoa. What I've attracted and what I've developed is way different based on who I am, what I am, and how I live my life. It's way different. So when I'm spiritually based, do I suffer from the things that I, when I'm no longer spiritually based? No. So what, what's an indication of that? What we used to be like, what happened and what I'm like now. So how do I find out what I used to be like absent of the alcohol problem? Step four. Step four is my charming personality left to my own thinking. 
most of that stuff didn't happen when I was drinking. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in your floor. That's you, unsupervised. Anybody surprised with their four step? <laughs> well, I was. I thought I was the best guy you ever wanted to meet. And then I started applying spiritual principles, right, to my life. And I have started having an exper- spiritual experience. I've governed by other ideas. Am I the same person as I was in my fourth? You know where they make a distinction on that? It's page 76. And the second half of how it works. Did I finish reading that or I just read it the way I read it? Read it. So they talk about here, after we finish the second part, I'll just finish this and then we'll go to page 76. They talk about after we read how it works. Many of us exclaim one note or I can't go through it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We're not saints. The point is we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to. We claim spiritual rather than spiritual. So they're saying here we, we, we kind of got our learner's license now. Somebody's gave us the basis on how to operate a vehicle safely in a community setting. We're able to go unsupervised now amongst the masses. Where before we were not so well unsupervised amongst the masses. Anybody ever find that? We're basically a shit show. Anybody a shit show here other than me? Yeah. So a collision with something or somebody, even though we thought, what's their problem? <laughs> you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So we're governed by different things. So where do we get this idea of what we used to be like is the fourth step. This is what a non-spiritual based living looks like. And if I want to be free from those things, what do I need to do to be free of those things? I need to learn how to live a spiritually based life. So if I'm living a spiritually based life, the things on page 76 talk about here. So if I'm living a spiritually based life, how would I be able to watch out for these character defects. What would exempt me from being falling prey to these character defects? How would I not be suffering those things anymore? What would I have to concentrate on in order not to suffer from the things I used to in my four? Yeah. So if you kind of read the second half here where they talk about we have listed all persons we had harmed to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of, out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. So if I'm not living that way anymore, will I be creating the damage that I used to in the past? Will I be having a different experience? So if I concentrate on my spiritual condition, what won't I have to worry about returning? Is a collision with people, places, things. I don't have to work on my character defects because they're a derivative of my spiritual condition. If I'm working on my, spirit, on my character defects, then I'm not convinced that self can, is the problem. I don't know how else to explain that. I'm worried about being able to govern a gas gauge on my car by myself again. But if I worry about my relationship with a power grid, and that's my concentration, then I don't suffer from all those things. So if I'm living in 10, that's a self-based, instinct-based living, isn't it? Because I'm still in collision with people, places, and things. I make an assessment after the accident, continue to watch for these things, not concentrate on things. Watch these because these are indications. So when I'm being selfish, inconsiderate, and dishonesty, what's that an indication of? Well, we're going to back it down the line. So in your fourth step, remember on, on the last column, I was selfish, inconsiderate, and dishonest because what was being interfered with? Instinct. My instincts, right? And I'm seeing I'm instinct basis because my spiritual condition is subsided. I become more instinct-based. I call it more Neanderthal-based, right? Because I go back to the part, like gathering, hunting, and securing, and all this. So I'm more concerned with me, regardless of the consequences around. I go to a, more of an animal-based living, instinct-based living. When I'm in instinct-based living, it starts to show up by my conflict with people, places, and things. 
What's the indication of that is selfish and considered dishonest. So if I, can I mask being selfish consider, and consider and dishonest? Oh, well, yeah. Driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. Anybody ever have to make amends to people they never thought they had to make amends to? Anybody surprised that you thought you're being so kind and helpful, but you're only thinking about yourself? I remember going back to make amends to my ex-girlfriend in Toronto. I don't to say everything right there. We had a nice candlelight dinner, reservations for two. I had to make amends for the amends. But if you ask me, if you ask me, my motives were left to my own devices. But I was being driven by my instincts. I was out of tune with what was happening. So if you want to concentrate and re develop your life, where would your concentration be? On your relationship with a power greater than yourself. Then the promises start coming true as the result of your relationship, not a result of you. That kind of sucked a bit, eh? <laughs> right on. For those who wish, we'll close with the uh, Lord's Prayer on Tuesday nights. Oh, it's funny. We have the worksheets up here for those who want to get involved. We uh, use the Lord's Prayer on Tuesday nights. It covers all the principles I suggested in Step 11. Our Father, our Father, to art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation and deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Can we get help cleaning the wreckage of our presence?